Uh, hello, everyone. So, when I first came to my first ZH conference in Lausanne in 2014, um, I used to introduce myself as a person who is doing a software digital edition, but at that time it was well, very much exaggeration. Uh, we just started first steps for the first grant proposal, but I found out that it's a very good, um, um, good presentation because these two names, Tolstoy and uh, Digital Edition, is a kind of green light. Uh, everybody knows who is Tolstoy, and everybody actually knows that he has wrote a lot, so this should be something large. So I'm very happy to present you some next steps which we have done during the last nine years. Okay. Mm. Yes, so as I've said, Tolstoy's legacy is unique in its scope and in its detail. So we have 90 volumes, a uh, complete edition of Tolstoy's works published. Uh, we have uh, a vast manuscript archive, it is partly digitized. Uh, we have a private library, his private library with his notes. We have many, many testimonies and memoirs about Tolstoy. And actually, when Tolstoy's life is known and described in details, we know almost every day, especially in his last years, what he has done, what he's eaten, whatever. And there have been, of course, a great research on Tolstoy's work and life, and a big, big bibliography of Tolstoy's studies, and there are even a lot of photos and even audio recordings of Tolstoy. So this is kind of an ocean. But, of course, we started with the core thing, uh, which is Tolstoy's complete edition in 90 volumes. Um, it's a very big complete edition. I tried to Google, preparing to this presentation, what is the largest complete edition in the world. I, I didn't got any answer. But, well, tell me if you know. But I think, like, it is very, very big. It is a stack of books, almost from the floor to the ceiling. And it is actually a rather decent corpus of 14 million and a half tokens. And uh, there are all published works and also all variants and unpublished drafts and fragments. And there are 13 volumes of diaries, which are actually very important. As um, Achenbaum coined it, Tolstoy would not be Tolstoy if he um, didn't try every day his diary notes. And there are 31 volumes uh, of uh, uh, 8,000 um, letters. And also, of course, this is a scholarly edition, and there is large critical apparatus, commentaries, and indexes. Um, and so what we wanted to do in 2014, we wanted to, uh, to get to know how to make a real scholarly digital edition, and we thought that if we choose Tolstoy, then we will know everything how to do that. <laughs> After that, not, we will not be afraid of anything. So, but it first started with the initiative of Fyokla Tolstoy, which is actually grand granddaughter, because this full edition in 90 volumes is a bibliographical rarity. You do not find it on the bookshelves in in Russian homes. Uh, it is really a very, very rare edition, and so she decided to make it available online. But the problem is that it is really very, very expensive to proofread. So she um, announced this initiative, all Tolstoy in one click, and it was extremely successful. Uh, and the first proofread of these volumes has been made by two weeks with about 3,000 of volunteers from 49 countries. And as a result, we have got 90 volumes, uh, which were freely available in different formats, and actually they are still available on the site uh, Tolstoy. And so this is where our Tolstoy Digital Initiative started, and the starting point was not very easy because actually we had HTML files of 90 volumes, and these HTML files were like very, very dirty HTML files. 
it was um, the result of OCRs, for example, we've got like 15 ways of HTML tags which signify uh, something in the center, and etc. It's hard to deal with that. And each volume is separate and there is no complete search in the whole edition. And actually we don't have a new table of contents of the whole edition. So actually we came to this project and we understood that we don't know what is inside. We don't have the list. And the Tolstoy texts, of course, are not distinguished for the critical collaborators. And we have the 91st volume, which is very, very important. This is complete index, but it was not proofread, proofread because volunteers are not very interesting of reading the indexes. And it is really difficult to use because it refers to volumes and pages, and then you should go and click and find I know, volume 53 and find the page 220 or whatever. And of course, all the complex techniques of scholarly paper edition has been preserved as it was like scanning. And they are really very peculiar and um, specific and scholarly. And uh, uh, so when we, took, when we came across this, we just stopped and thought what we are going to do. And actually, we had three opposing goals. So, from one hand, we would like really to make a digital preservation of this 19 volume edition because it actually is a cultural heritage, because it is a very rare edition. And by the way, we did not want to take responsibility of different interpretive solutions. And so we are not Tolstoy researchers, we are more digital humanists. And well, we would not like to make a new edition of Tolstoy. So let, let it be as it is. It's just these, these solutions are the solutions of the editors. And uh, actually, well, the ideal decision in this way would be kind of diplomatic digital edition. But on the other hand, we would like to, to make a kind of big platform for linking the entire Tolstoy legacy. And we just thought of Tolstoy as a hub for cultural connections. Well, Tolstoy has uh, correspondence, for example, with Mahatma Gandhi and Edison. He has reacted to the most important social and political and cultural events in the end of the 19th century. It, it can be like kind of big, big, big link to open data around Tolstoy with text and everything. And so, the, of course, then we thought of kind of digital archive and database. And then there is also another thing that actually all the start of the project was to make his legacy publicly accessible. And also, I would like to remind you that Tolstoy himself has refused to get any royalties from his writings, which was very helpful, hurtful for his family, but very good to the people. And so the idea was just like make it free, make it transparent. And of course, XML um, files is not something that is transparent to ordinary readers. So, I mean, the, here the best decision would be like make a website and make transparent user scenarios in the way uh, what do you, what do ordinary common readers want from Tolstoy's legacy and maybe you even do not need TI in this, uh, with this goal. So we decided to combine all these three things and um, just, uh, I made this short uh, short um, uh, uh, abbreviations because they just a little somehow to, to, to note what solution was motivated with what goal. Sometimes they um, uh, go together. So we started with the question, how many Tolstoy texts do we have? As I said, we didn't have a complete uh, table of contents. And the problem is that, okay, with works, we know all that there is a difficult question, so where, what is the text, what is, uh, is the draft the same text or the other text, and yes, we have, for example, 20 versions of Tolstoy's novel uh, Resurrection, and a lot of drafts, fragments, ideas, and like syllabus, short in three, war, well, in, in three sentences about also his novels and whatever, so very, very many texts, but this is somehow you can uh, decide because the idea was firstly to, to, to cut and to, to cut each text in a separate file and then to count them and to organize them 
in some kind of textual database. But there is also problems with diaries, which have been published as several notebooks. Well, you have entries separated by dates, but some of them are very approximately dated, but we also can't cut this diaries, these entries into different files, like different texts. But we also had notes, which were also published as several notebooks, and they are written in continuous flow, and you really don't know how to, to cut, cut them in, um, in different texts, though they are different notes. So the notes were just uh, uh, conceptualized as several notebooks. And then there is Tolstoy's ABC textbook, and these are exercises and reading materials, and there are actually almost identical books, but in the second books there are more, uh, the reading, well, he has added some more um, stories, and of course, like, and the first book is actually facsimile, even in this 90s well, this edition, and of course maybe you should take it as an ABC textbook, but the problem is that some of the best known Tolstoy stories just come out of this ABC textbook, so actually you should also somehow cut it, but sometimes the story is just one line, so very complicated. And then you have this reading list, Krug Chtenia, this is, I think, two volumes of out of 90 volumes, and this is a compendium which Tolstoy has met, uh, made out of his text, and also he retold some text, and so he also made some direct qu quotes, for example, a story by Chekhov. And then also you have these thoughts for everyday life. This is a calendar of quotations selected by Tolstoy, which is very interesting, and, uh, but these quotations have been sometimes edited by him, and sometimes we even cannot attribute so who who is quoted. So this is all thing very complicated, but well, to make it short, we have more than 6,573 texts more because, well, there are some, some, also some issues we have still to decide in this last things. And so we had some our coding solutions. Uh, so one of the one very important thing that we really would like to preserve connections with the paper edition, and so the most brilliant technical decision I ever came through in my project was to make this combination of volume and pages starting and the ending as an file ID because it is unique, like digital and very human friendly, uh, and of also a short name. And then, of course, we provided the most extensive metadata, which we also coded in the header, and we had to introduce a lot of new categories, because, um, uh, and that was important also for our digital archive to operate the files, and also for our user scenarios. For example, our users, of course, could not manage 28 different genres, which were um, uh, classified by the editors, so we just simplify them into six, whatever. And uh, so you see the you see the, some uh, work categories we have. So we well, okay, genre topic for essays, fiction, non-fiction, very important. Also published during lifetime after death, which is also important. So whether actually uh, Tolstoy was accepted this text or not, <laughs> and of course variants and drafts, and this may be Tolstoy, not Tolstoy for this um, uh, reading list and whatever. And also we made some text take coding of some editorial corrections, which is actually, this is not a manuscript, but the idea was to change a little bit reading exper experience. So you see here um, how it is now in the website, so there is something unreadable, and it is like a picture of something unreadable, but if you click there, you can see the, the something that the editor suppose, like supposedly Vasily, but it was how it was in the paper edition, and the thing is that within a linear reading, you first read the 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 idea of the editor what or what is it and then you see the question mark and maybe you will not even pay attention on the question mark and so we wanted this reader to see the original text and to think about it and it's very important especially for the diaries and for the notes because there are a lot of abbreviations if you remember Anna Karenina the 
the characters, they speak to each other in the, some very important moments with long, long sentences of abbreviated, of just first letters, and this is what Tolstoy did a lot in his writings. So, another very important thing was text family concept. So, we had a need to turn these ties, the titles, to manage textual variants. This scholarly tradition of heavy exhaustive namings didn't suit us, like variants of the second and third editions of childhood. It's very hard to manage them, organize this in the alphabetical order. And another very important thing we understood that we really need another navigator in a non linear textual environment because, in a volume, we have the main text and you have these variants and drafts and like very, very, very small drafts in the end. But in the web portal, you just have them everywhere and you don't have this order. And we also wanted to link related by different texts. For example, Tolstoy has written an afterword to the Kreutzer Sonata where he explained why he has written such a strange text. And so we want them to be somehow together. And also we wanted to, to, to have all these commentaries, uh, these critical apparatus, for example, these papers about how the text was prepared, also together with Tolstoy's text. And also we have a chronology of Tolstoy's relevant life period for all the volumes, and we also have, would like to somehow to refer to that. And also for our um, users, we made some short annotations of the text. And the future, actually, other works on Tolstoy research related to the text could be added to this family, and maybe letters and diaries, etc. And so we have this family structure, and it is quoted in, in the format of Bible list, in um, take quoting, the idea that is you have kind of meta name for the family, short name, and then you have all this main text and variants and editions and everything with uh, its own metadata. And it is. Um, um, represented as a kind of text family card in a text catalog, which actually gives users direct access to the text without any search. So this is UX and digital uh, archives decision. And then we also made something from index. So the, it is the very important thing to preserve the work that this scholarly um, editor has made because some reference a very non-trivial and nobody would be able to do that once again, <laughs> I'm afraid. And so and it is not um, easy to do in a machine way. So what we did, we proofread the Nancy first volume, we linked it to Wikidata if possible, this is in the UX decision, and then we use space in there for all texts, including commentaries, and we extract this triple person name volume page, and we compared that with index leaks and assigned confidence weights, and then we checked manually if the weighting was not high, and then we classified persons according to categories. This is also in the UX decision, and so you, we have this also illustrations of uh, all the of 3,000 persons marked up in the text, so while the user can click and see, I don't know, Alexander Makedonsky or maybe Postal Contemporaries or even his families, um, and that's my, my well, I'm going to add that so. Well, uh, when we have done, we have understood that we even now can make some distant reading of Tolstoy's legacy, and we have different interesting inf infographics. I'll show you only the one, which is actually the distribution of fiction and non-fiction of Tolstoy's life timeline, and we see how Tolstoy has evolved from a uh, Romanist and a writer to a thinker because the end of his life. So on the, uh, the y-axis, this is the number of pages, and on the x-axis, this is particular year. So how many pages has he, has he wrote in a particular year, in fiction and not fiction? And so we can see this kind of evolution, which we know very well from the literary scholars, but it is always interesting to see the numbers, and I think we'll also um, find something interesting um, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.